capitalism, all of the gains in automation, it goes to the owner class. All you have to do is have everyone be an owner, and now suddenly, any gain in automation is a gain for everybody. If you grow just one thing, it may not grow as well as if it grows with another thing. A good example of that is called the, the Three Sisters Method of Farming. There is definitely multi-apartment buildings or multi-families that do do a path of A hundred million dollars that they gave to Joe Rogan that they would kind of be out if they breach contract. Is that a bigger number? Or is two billion a bigger number? <laughs> It's a tough one, I know. Really hard. And maybe, maybe yes. comparing numbers is not uh, Jeremy Strong. Gotta go kill a Jenny. So I don't think you should kill her. I don't think it's a good idea. It's a ghost, dude. Welcome back, everybody, to Bread Theory. So tonight we are continuing on with a people's history of the United States, and we are getting into the really difficult part. Uh, in fact, the the reader who is, is reading the audiobook version of this chapter says that this is the chapter that finally broke them as a reader, as a narrator. Um, we're dealing with American slavery tonight, everybody. So that cheery, fun topic. Um, but we do this not because it's necessarily fun. Well, hello, Jet Extremist. Good to have you. How was is, how is the rest of the show last night? Looked like y'all were having a bunch of fun. Um, anyway, we do this not because the topics are easy to deal with or necessarily cheery subject matter, but because it's important to know the real unvarnished U.S. history that you don't really often get taught in any level of education. Uh, joining me tonight is, is my lovely wife, Amanda. How you doing tonight? Cold. Right. You? Um, yeah, it's chilly in our apartment. We still haven't found that that balance yet with the thermostat, so we are working on that. We had a busy day at school. It is a busy day at school. Yeah, you got to go to the Y. Yeah. I did not. <laughs> I can outrun everyone. Yes, they better that's watch what we've out. determined. <laughs> so you're the, you're the class champion sprinter. Mm -hmm. Um. How are you feeling about going into this chapter? This is the heaviest subject matter we've done yet, and we've done some pretty brutal, bloody ones. I think it's important. Mm -hmm. And I feel like it's something we need to normalize, talking about things that are ugly and unpleasant and difficult and right. going through those motions and emotions. Ooh. Processing, yes. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. Because that's the only way you grow. Right. Well, that's the only way that you kind of learn some of the, the underpinnings of, of the truth. Well, the, not only the truth, but the systems that were put in place uh, during the past and still have influence over today. Now, we are well over 100 years past slavery. Um, I guess we're over 150 years at this point. But do we act like it? But... We, in many ways, we, we have not gotten past that mentality that, that one group is essentially inferior than another. White supremacy still reigns supreme in the U.S., uh, whether it's conscious or unconscious. And uh, the effects of a people being robbed of everything and kept in the most destitute, desperate situation imaginable or, uh, for generations, for hundreds of years, uh, you know, many, many generations, uh, the, the effects of that system is still, you know, reverberating through the present day. Uh, not to mention the, the fact that Jim Crow was, was a reaction to Reconstruction, concession back again to the South for some reason, I always have to, uh, make concessions to the the owner class um, every time there's a, a great upheaval and a great bit of progress. Somehow they, they always have to be appeased, at least in this country. And so Jim Crow was that. Yeah, right, Jet. Yeah, you should probably prep yourself for a shower because this is going to be gross. As I, as I was mentioning, this is the, as the, as the, narrator of this chapter says this is the chapter that finally broke them as a narrator 
And mind you, we have been through genocide, literal genocide of the, some of the original native peoples of the Caribbean in this book. Um, this is even worse in certain ways. Not that it's ever a competition or you can fairly compare one to one, but yeah, it's going to get bad. It's going to get real bad. Um, yeah. <laughs> Odds are real good. I'm probably gonna this cry and have continent. to leave early. And and all of the glory of America has just been established on on plains of blood and human misery. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a very stark contrast to the you know plucky go getter spirit of adventure and discovery that that we're taught about. As, as being embodied in the likes of Columbus and um, the Founding Fathers and all this stuff. Yeah. Find this. All right. Um, let's, yeah, so let's not shy away anymore. Let's get into it. Unless you had anything else you wanted to bring up before we started, Amanda. Uh, no, that's okay. All right. You're the boss. So, this is the first chapter where the N-word makes an appearance. And that is not because Howard Zinn said it. It's because he wants to quote primary texts in full as they were written. However, however, as you will hear right at the beginning of this chapter, the particular narrator of this version of the, the audiobook has decided to omit that word because it does not actually add anything to the text. We all know what's being said and people don't really need to hear it. So, mm-hmm. you know, kudos to them. I, I thank them personally recently, and they, they were very nice. Um, but yeah, you will not hear the N-word. They will just say the word N-word, where it is quoted. Um, and I'm, I'm assuming that's going to be the case for the rest of the book, because it will continue to make appearances, <laughs> that word. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. I, I understand uh, the, the the tactical use of the N-word, as some I... may put it, but I tend to just disagree with it. Like, that, there's, there's just, there's no reason to, to actually say it. Uh, I think it's kind of the opposite of, of Voldemort. The more you say it, the more power you give it, because it gives other people permission to, oh, God, ads. Gives other people permission to say it. Uh, it normalizes the use of it. I think that's one of those things that it's okay to remain taboo. Yeah. But also, the N word has negative, very, very <laughs> negative connotations for all involved when it is spoken because of what it is. Voldemort's just a dirtbag. Yeah, right. Right. <laughs> so it's. Yeah. It's different. It definitely is different. So. All right. Well, uh, looks like ads have just started up, so we're going to wait just a, a few seconds before we actually get into the text. Um, we're opposite today. How are we opposite today? I was sunny yellow last time, and then you were blue, and now oh, I'm blue. Oh, wow. And you're yellow. So you're my, you're my, my little blue, gray rain cloud hovering over the honeybees? Yeah, mm-hmm. what am I? I'm a Mr. honeybee. Sun. Oh, I'm Mr. Sun. Sun, Mr. <laughs> Golden Sun. <laughs> Please shine down. On wow, me. you sound like you really want that sunshine. Jeez. Wake up, sunshine. Jordan Peterson needs to suck an egg. Do you know? <laughs> I don't know if this tweet is real. So I want it to be though. I'm so sure. you know, take that with a grain of salt. I want it to be real. That apparently Jordan Peterson recently said that, you know, Elon Musk is doing God's work purging Twitter of child pornography. I spent a good three hours looking for child pornography and I couldn't find a single one. Well done. <laughs> I mean, uh, uh, what the actual. Fuck? Yeah, right. Like that's that that's is... a good thing to broadcast to everyone. Yeah, right. <laughs> I wonder if that's real. I'm pretty sure that's not where people go to look for that kind of shit anyway. 
I'm you know all the all the the platforms um, have problems with it popping up because people post stuff that they're not supposed to all the time. They'll make you yeah, know well, burner accounts and stuff. Minecraft and keep it going. And Roblox that gets all sorts of like... yeah right. People people do horrible <laughs> horrific things, no matter what the the terms of service say, because they just keep making burner accounts. Um, oh, but I, I remember hearing a story about people that that you know do in person like like live moderation for Facebook just having to quit after maybe a week of it because they just see so much graphic disturbing things it's just uh could it be could world it be uh, suck? many parts of the world are very fucked up people really suck uh i want to i want to look up that tweet real quick <laughs> let's go to twitter uh <laughs> I kind of hope it's real. There's though. not enough quotes like this that are going to soften the blow of what we're going to listen to. So No, but hey. Maybe maybe it'll be a, a palate cleanser. Maybe I won't even say if it's real. Jordan Peterson. Let's look it up. Dr. Jordan B. Peterson. Uh, let's see. Well, it's not coming up in the, the most recent tweets, but how do I see more? I I very much dislike Twitter. I'm not really ever on it. You like it because you kept it. But I, I keep it because it is just one of those things that, like, if you're going to make any sort of an impact in an online space, you kind of got to do it. All right. I don't know how to see his later tweets. It's only showing me the first few. Like, I don't have this much shit to say every, like, ten minutes. Oh, here we go. Here's some more. Yeah, right? He, he, he appears to be addicted to it. Uh, let's see. Elon Musk looks like he did a photo shoot specifically for this purpose. I, I would say he did. did he That's the reason he bought it, just so he could like buy friends, basically. That's usually what your parents teach you, is you can buy friends if you want. Yeah. Yeah. That's what my mom always tells me. Hey, Brett, you want a friend? <laughs> just buy one on the internet. Yeah. Uh, uh, all right. Well, I'm not finding it. Okay, let's move on. It's time to talk about important stuff. I'm getting tired. It's time to talk about important stuff. She yawns. Uh, he did it to get booed on stage. Oh, my God. If it's written in a text, there might be a reason in terms of context. That said, maybe don't say that out loud. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Uh, yep. Yeah, and well, that's the thing is you never know with, with uh, old Jordan B. Well, they're not. He's he actually means what he says. I need headphones, please. Oh, I'm so sorry. Where are my manners? Yeah, geez. Only you get to get traumatized today. <laughs> this, no, this is this is a group experience. All I got done was grabbed in the neck. <laughs> mm -hmm. But that did. That, don't say it like that. <laughs> It wasn't me either. It was at our work. We work with people that have special needs. Yep. And that is one of his ways to get attention is he will he will put his hand lightly on Softly. someone's neck. Always on the then, front of your neck. Just yeah. like on your chest. Right. right. <laughs> Jesus. Here we go. This recording is a product of Audio Anarchy, a people's history of the United States. By Howard Zinn. Nope. Oh, jeez, oh, what did it do? Time for a commercial. No, 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 no. The internet really sucks. Chapter 9. Here. Slavery without submission, emancipation 
without freedom. Yeah, so check out Audio Before Anarchy. Again, I'd like to issue a brief content warning and explanation. There are quite a number of racial slurs that come up in this chapter on slavery, believe it or not. Um, any quote that contains the N-word, I am simply reading it as just that. Quote the N-word, unquote. Um, I'm not going to say that word with my mouth. Just, no, not about that. And if you have an issue with that, bye. Too bad. Yeah, right. I mean, there's other versions of the The United audiobook. States government's support of slavery was based on an overpowering practicality. In 1790, a thousand tons of cotton were being produced every year in the South. By 1860, it was a million tons. In the same period, 500,000 slaves grew to 4 million. A there's system like a 20... Carried a 20 year difference between a thousand to a million? Did I miss here? Yeah, let's go back. I believe that's right, but. In the South. By 1860, on an overpowering practicality. In 1790, a thousand tons of cotton were being produced every year in mm -hmm. the South. By 1860, it was a million tons. Okay, so a little more than. In the same period, 500,000 slaves grew to 4 million. A system harried by slave rebellions and conspiracies. Gabriel Prosser in 1800, Denmark Vesey in 1822, Nat Turner in 1831, developed a network of controls in the southern states, backed by the laws, courts, armed forces, and race prejudice of the nation's political leaders. It would take either a full-scale slave rebellion or a full-scale war to end such a deeply entrenched system. If a rebellion, it might get out of hand and turn its ferocity beyond slavery to the most successful system of capitalist enrichment in the world. So, um, just a little aside. The system we live in seems pretty overpowering, pretty eternal. Um, I always like to use that Ursula K. Le Guin quote. Um, Capitalism seems... Oh, let me get it right now. I can never get it right. Uh, Capitalism bad. Yes, thank you. Okay. <clears throat> we live in capitalism. Its power seems inescapable. So do the divine right of kings. Any human power can be resisted and changed by human beings. So here we have yet another economic system, that of a slave state. And I like to categorize a slave economy as, as different from even feudalism. Uh, because rather than having lords and serfs where there is a certain degree of autonomy uh, for the, the serfs, that some of their time actually is their own. They're maybe not free to travel wherever they want, but, you know, they're not chained up. Um, this is a different economic relationship where there's no hope of escape. Uh, depending on the, the degree of slavery, there's no hope of ever not being a slave. I mean, there, there were many instances of slavery where you'd be slave for a certain number of years, or there's the... Indentured service. Right, and then that's what the, the racial, you know, slavery apologists always like to bring up. Is, oh, there's, you know, the, the Irish, they, they were, a bunch of them were indentured servants. Well, sure, that oh. could also be looked at as a, a very comparatively mild form of slavery diet slavery yeah slavery you know slavery light uh less filling um where you would sell yourself basically into slavery although you still had much more rights than than uh chattel slaves well you were that that slave you couldn't be beaten to death you know i, I would doubt that a you know a slave a a, a master could have its have his way with uh, a indentured servant woman and not face consequences so on and so forth so still that 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 form of slavery was a temporary one with more rights uh, nowhere near the same thing as chattel slavery um, chattel slavery was unique perhaps in recorded history as it was hereditary it was racial so anyone with a certain skin tone, unless for, for some reason uh, were freed, uh, they were a slave for their entire life. Uh, so were their children. They could be bought and sold as property. It was basically as dehumanizing as you can possibly make a person. 
Not to mention, not only do they pay in their time and their labor creating products to be sold, but they're paying in blood, sweat, and tears as well. Mm. And getting nothing. Right, yeah, you get you get nothing in return. So at least um, during feudalism, the serfs got to have, you know, the, 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 their, their excess products were taken by the Lord up to a certain amount, and they got to have whatever was left over. And they also basically had free run of their land. Uh, so terrible, horrible, not a great system. Not nearly the same as slavery, though. And that's why I, I put slavery as a unique uh, economic relationship. Uh, because, yeah, different from feudalism, different from capitalism, different from socialism, for sure. Um, but anyway, back back to the, the central point I was trying to make. Imagine living under the time of slavery and looking at that system seeing that it had been there for hundreds of years at, you know, you're talking about the 1800s. It had been there on this continent for hundreds of years in relatively the same form, uh, unchanged. Uh, the, the economy was completely built around it, uh, around the, this free human labor. Um, and it would have seemed completely inescapable, completely eternal, just, just like, Ursula K. Le Guin describes capitalism, but it, 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 it ended. It got to a point where the people said enough. We don't want this anymore. Um, I'm not going to say that, that every person who took up arms against, uh, the South was, was doing it for the right reasons, uh, for noble reasons of any kind. They may have still felt that, that black people were very far beneath them. You know, obviously, white supremacy survived slavery and, and still is alive and well. Well, I shouldn't say well, but it still is alive and influential today. So, obviously, not everyone that, that went through that time period felt the same about it. Um, the ideas surrounding the, you know, the, the bulwark of why slavery was justified still remain to some degree today. But the system itself collapsed. It was driven out of existence. It took a incredibly brutal and bloody war, the Civil War, to accomplish it. But it, 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 it ended. And in... I mean, it's, it's not exactly the, the cheeriest thought, but, but in a certain way, that shows that any system is... is uh, or I should say it this way, no system is invincible. Any system can be changed if enough people want to do it. It doesn't matter how entrenched the powers appear to be. Uh, much of that is just <laughs> the inertia of history, the, you know, the, the cultural zeitgeist. All it takes is enough people committed to changing it, and they will change it. So the same can be true of capitalism. We don't have to live in capitalism forever. We can, we can dream beyond a system where virtually all the gains go straight to the top and the rest of us are left to handle the crumbs. And it's funny how much it's always like, it'll trickle down. It'll trickle down. Of course they're going to take care of you. <laughs> right. Yes. They, they have been pissing down our backs and calling it trickle down since Reagan was in office. And it's funny how that has never actually ended up all that wealth. Hey, it stays at the top for now 40 years uh -huh. um weird how that happens i ain't seen no trickle no no not 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 me either so yeah so we can think of a better system where you don't get to take the the um product of other people's labor just because you happen to be an owner um where we help each other reach our 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 you know, each one of ours uh, flourishing as, as much as possible, where um, the, the, the combination of all sorts of ideas that never would have seen the light of day in our current system for lack of resources, lack of the right connections, uh, will instead be brought together and used to try and make us all live better. 
we can dream of that system and we can enact it if enough, if enough of us want it. And it may not be easy and it may not be entirely peaceful. Um, it's hard to say. I would, I, you know, myself, I prefer a peaceful transfer of power to back to the people. I would prefer to set up parallel systems, you know, uh, they, they call it uh, prefiguration or um, creating a shadow government sort of thing, setting up new systems of distributing power in the, the dying husk of capitalism. Because it, it appears to me that capitalism, the wheels are falling off. You know, it, it's, it's time is coming to an end. This, this Reagan revolution is skidding to a halt pretty quickly. Skid mark. Um, Thanks. <laughs> uh, anyway. Sorry, I'm just trying to keep all it right. light for um, the time. Yeah. All right. Enough. Enough ranting. Let's get back oh. <laughs> into. Oh, did you have more you want to say? Uh, I didn't get a chance to really say much, but that's okay. We can keep going. No, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I honestly, my thoughts are gone because we. Oh. It's okay. Well, if you think. Anyway. Going through this chapter, at least keep with you a glimmer of hope in knowing that this this horrible system of brutality and economic exploitation to the extreme finally ended, and so can ours. If a war, those who made the war would organize its consequences. Hence, it was Abraham Lincoln who freed the slaves, so not John soft Brown. In 1859, John Brown was hanged with federal complicity. What do you mean, soft consequences? They cause the war, but they also organize their consequences. So are they really going to be that harsh on themselves? Or are they going to be, oh? Yeah. Well, are you talking about after the Civil War? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, the promise of 40 acres and a mule was given out to, I don't know, something like 100,000 freed slaves. Which is a drop in the bucket compared to the four million. And then also it was before they rescinded it and took the land back for most of them and gave it back to the former slave masters as compensation for loss of property. The not, property being human beings. Not that it's at all the same thing, but it does make me think of a certain ten thousand dollars that was <laughs> Yeah, right. Dangled ten and to twenty thousand away. Yeah, sure, let's do it, Jack. Oh well just kidding. <laughs> yeah. But God, how cruel do you have to be to be on the other side of that? No, no, no debt relief for anybody. Let them all drown. <laughs> God. Karma. Uh, I mean, let's hope, but who knows? Going, going forward, though, let's let's hear the rest. City yeah. for attempting to do by small scale violence what Lincoln would do by large scale violence several years later. Ah, oh, that's an important point. I don't want it to be lost because I keep pausing it, which I apologize. There's going to be a lot to say here. Um, he's he's talking about John Brown doing at small scale and, you know, ending up getting hanged for it. What Lincoln would do on a much more massive scale, not that much later. So John Brown being the uh, white man, the abolitionist, slave abolitionist, who really lived his values, organized the slave rebellion, and... Um, was, was actually fairly successful until he was finally caught and hung. But uh, It's pretty amazing how seeing people as people is just a very, very difficult thing in this time. Oh, geez. I mean, you know what? We, we deal with that day in and day out at our, our jobs now. A I, lot of... Oh, go ahead. I know. It's just, it's difficult for me to fathom because oh, it's me not... Too the lens that I view the world with, but I know, whatever, I'm fucking right, okay? <laughs> right. I don't care anymore. I agree. People and... are people, and people should be treated with dignity yeah. no matter their... There should be no throwaway people, yeah. is the bottom line. Right. And we deal with the mentality that, oh, some people are just a law's cause, uh, constantly at the job that we're at, where we work with uh, adults with... with um, ASD. ASD, which is is um, autism spectrum disorder. It's called a disorder. I don't know that I'd even characterize it as necessarily a disorder, just a different way of 
the brain being wired. But for some, it can be a disability because it makes it harder to communicate and process thought and stuff like that. But I digress. Anyway, we deal with uh, the people, especially the ones that we work with most, being thought of as, well, there are too many behaviors. Let's just institutionalize them. Um, too much running around the school, stealing other kids' food. Let's just institutionalize them. That, that seems to be the go-to. Oh, let's put hands on them. Bad behavior. Let's put our hands on them and, and redirect by force, uh, even if they're not being a danger to themselves or anyone else. Even though everything I've been taught is behavior is speech. Right. Behavior is communication. They're telling you what they want. To me, someone running around the building, hey, they're bored. They need more stuff to and that's, do. That's certainly true uh, in this case, I would say. And as far as food, maybe they're hungry. Maybe they need some oral stimuli. Uh -huh. Like it, like or, a mint or yeah. a sour candy can be very soothing to someone sure. who needs that sort of stimuli. Or they, they tell you that they need space and back off and you don't and then they hit you. Well, they mm. fucking told you, bitch. They back did. Off. And you didn't respect their boundary. <laughs> Uh, you know, not to mention, you never know what, what situation a lot of these students are coming from, how home life is. Uh, but the idea that the, the go-to should always just be force, discipline, um, constant, you know, just getting on their ass about every little thing, and then throwing up your hands when, when you get frustrated and saying, well, they... Uh, deserve to go to an even higher security place and, and potentially be committed. No, and that's certainly not to say that that is the, the overall opinion of everyone that we work with. We work with some really great people that do see the humanity in these, these kids, but we work with other people, a lot of them in admin who just. Like if you're frustrated, tap out. Don't seem to. I really don't think there's a problem with tapping out my old school. I tapped out. Mm hmm I got in trouble for it, but I mean, that student was so done with me and. Right. And then that should be okay. Uh, but anyway, the point being, uh, humans are really good at dehumanizing other humans that they just don't want to deal with. And rather than doing the hard work of talking things through or, you know, having to deal with the wound of being hurt by somebody without lashing out and retaliating. Um, it's just too much for them. So they, they just choose the, well, they you know, loss causes forever sort of mentality. And it's sad to see, but you know, again, there's hope. Oh, I think, <laughs> I don't know if all of this is making any of us better or not, but do you have anything else before we continue? No. Anyway, John Brown, pretty cool guy. Check him out. End slavery. With slavery abolished by order of the government, true, a government pushed hard to do so by blacks, free, and slave, and by white abolitionists, its end could be orchestrated so as to set limits to emancipation. Liberation from the top would go only so far as the interests of dominant groups permitted. If carried further by the momentum of war, the rhetoric of crusade, it could be pulled back to a safer position. Thus, while the ending of slavery led to a reconstruction of national politics and economics, it was not a radical reconstruction, but a safe one. In fact, a profitable one. The plantation system, based on tobacco growing in Virginia, North Carolina, and Kentucky, and rice in South Carolina, expanded into lush new cotton lands in Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, and needed more slaves. But slave importation became illegal in 1808. Therefore, quote, from the beginning, the law went unenforced, says John Hope Franklin from Slavery to Freedom, quote, the long, unprotected coast, the certain markets, and the prospects of huge profits were too much for the American merchants, and they yielded to temptation." Unquote. He estimates that perhaps 250,000 slaves were imported illegally before the Civil War. Another fact that you don't really hear about in most American textbooks, if they cover the fact that, you know, in 1808, it was finally illegal to import slaves, which 
good. It's it's kind of like, uh, I believe it's a Malcolm X quote. He's like, if you stab me in the back and then you pull the knife out an inch, it's you haven't undone the damage. That's not progress. You actually made the situation worse because you've dislodged the clot. Well, I mean, I'm, in a very literal way, yes. But also, you're still stabbing somebody. If you pull it all the way out, that doesn't just make the wound go away. Uh, healing people, healing up wounds, national wounds, takes a lot more than that. Um, so, so good that it was, it was, uh, the the importation of slaves were uh, uh, um, abolished in eighteen oh eight, but illegal ones were were still imported. Here's an estimate of two hundred fifty thousand by the time the civil war starts. Who knows how many? Because it's going to be undocumented stuff. And hey, human smuggling, human trafficking, uh, illegal slavery still happens in the U.S. And also legal slavery still happens in the U.S. Thanks to the 13th Amendment. Again, a big concession. Um, the idea in, in that amendment that you are not allowed to enslave people unless they have been imprisoned. Um, I don't think it even has to be a federal prison. But in certain states, they still have legal slavery for prisoners. You can force work at zero pay. And in many states, they can force work for, well, basically peanuts, like like literally uh, five cents an hour, 10 cents an hour, stuff like that. So materially, no real difference from no cents an hour. Um, but beyond that, yeah. This is gonna be a difficult journey. Yeah, it is, it is. Well, because it's two hours. Oh man, this is a really long chapter. I guess because it's just that We're pivotal get, like, in American history. In. Yeah, oh. sorry. How can slavery be described? Perhaps not at all by those who have not experienced it. The 1932 edition of a best-selling textbook by two northern liberal historians saw slavery as perhaps the Negro's, quote, necessary transition to civilization, unquote. Uh, Economy. Uh. What a fucking condescending way of looking at other people's. Right, because people... They need it to be civilized. Also, maybe we just get to understand someone else's fucking culture besides your own swine. Well, no, they, they, they worship some crazy uh, uh, pantheon of gods that we have no understanding of. Why might of. that be? They must be wrong, because they don't accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. I'm going to break something. <laughs> Uh, there's just so much condescension, Amen. but it but it always is coupled with incredible fragility, like you know with, with that condescension, the idea that you know, two people of their own free will of different races would then just decide to have a relationship was just so abhorrent that you know people ladies would faint and 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 uh, you know they'd often go and kill the the couple for for doing that because. That's just how fragile their business, world is. Because other they, people do. Well, they, you know, it's 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 the constant cry of the conservative, the the ultra conservative, I should even say, that it's the 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 death knell of Western civilization if we start uh, intermarrying with those people. That's what they still say to this day. About I know it. it's just it's just it's sick, it's gross, it's wrong, but it's just also kind of comical how incredibly fragile it is. Like. It's just like the same generation that, that, that calls all millennials and, and, and Gen Zers snowflakes. It's hard to imagine these people aren't in diapers still. Well, right, because this is the same generation that would like have a heart attack if they saw a black person drinking at a white person's water fountain. How incredibly fragile can you be? Oh, no, a person of a different race drank out of the same water fountain as me. That has to be the height of fragility. So it's just, it's just strange how those two always go together. This just utter condescension and sense of superiority. If you really were secure in your superiority, what the hell would it matter what other people did? 
like, is this person nice? Does this person treat others with respect? Respect, dignity, yeah. Yeah. Right. That's your baseline. I agree. But these people, oh, just, oh, the thought of it. What's with some of this? Is that steak? Oh. Oh, yeah, yeah. Moving on. Best so, so look out for this fragility coming along with it. Statistical historians have tried to assess slavery by estimating how much money was spent on slaves for food and medical care. But can this describe the reality of slavery as it was to a human being who lived inside it? No, this just describes how important it was as an economic system for very f fortunate um, people who were in positions to own other human beings. Uh, fortunate see, seems even a gross way to describe it, but financially fortunate. But I mean, I guess the same is true of billionaires today. You can call them fortunate, and in a certain way they are, but still, all oh, their wealth comes at the gross exploitation of the planet and, and so many scores of people to prop up their wealth that it's a really fortunate and you're a really disgusting person to accept all that. Accept it. I worked hard for it. <laughs> My yeah. blood, sweat, and tears, and I started with nothing but a twelve million dollars from my family. <laughs> yeah. nothing, nothing. nothing. I a, started with nothing. Nothing but the winnings from my uh, father's emerald mine in apartheid South Africa. Oh, oh, nothing but a loan from mommy and daddy to to start up my uh, largest online retailer shop in the world um nothing but my wife being the sole breadwinner for years and and also getting a loan while i built up uh, microsoft corporation not to mention stealing a bunch of shit from ibm but hey uh yeah look at any of these supposed self-made millionaires billionaires it's all coming from the labor of other people even if you earned every single dollar and then instead of getting a loan or help from anyone, you started your own business. At some point, that point being this time you start hiring other people, every dollar you get after that is in part made by the efforts of other people. So nobody rises alone. Everyone has help from a lot of other people who are not getting fully compensated for their labor just because you happen to be the owner. So you there's no such thing special. as the self-made billionaire or millionaire. Millionaire. Um, I suppose once in a while you get a major pop star or perhaps a really high priced lawyer or doctor. Maybe one of those people could be a millionaire without having employees, uh, without having any sort of ownership stake in any company. But that's very few and far between. Mm -hmm. Are the conditions of slavery? But is it really? Because like they have to be able to get into med school, and I feel like there are a lot of stipulations sure. in the way of one getting in. The only distinction I'm trying to draw is Sorry. between the owner class and the working class. To be a working class millionaire is virtually impossible unless you happen to have a tremendous amount of talent in a very sought after field. Like you could be the, the, the most talented person in our field. And unless you are owning one of the companies that, that administers the services that ours does, you're never going to be a millionaire. Nope. Because the care industry is, is, well, I mean, it's, it's pretty no sexist. It's seen as women's care. work. It's seen as, um, you know, also serving people that, that don't deserve it by, by a lot of uh, really disgusting people. Who are we to decide people. who is and isn't worthy? Yeah, of... you're a human being. Yeah. You deserve to have a life that is as fulfilling and prosperous. But this is so odd. As it can be. Dacious compared to, like, you think about that pro birthers like oh it's alive they were ready to take yeah. it away man it's right. like no jerk it's a cluster of cells you know what else shows up like a cluster of cells cancer well okay but that, that's never really gonna convince them but but no i know uh, no, no uh, i i i get where you're coming let me from. make my point oh, I'm sorry yeah i mean you're you're right they they don't actually care about living breathing human beings they only care they're only pro-birth right and usually there's an underlying racist reason for that too you know something like oh the great replacement theory or you know genocide of an entire people or through i mean 
voluntary <gasps> not reproducing, but whatever. Getting a little off topic. Let's I... rein it back. No, that's okay. Oh. As the existence Fine. of slavery? John Little, a former slave, wrote, quote, They say slaves are happy because they laugh and are merry. I myself and three or four others have received 200 lashes in the day and had our feet in fetters. Yet at night we would sing and dance and make others laugh at the rattling of our chains. Happy men we must have been. We did it to keep down trouble and to keep our hearts from being completely broken. That is as true as the gospel. Just look at it. Yeah, I mean, you see the same sort of thing in internment camps, in prisoner of war camps, um, any sort of prison camp. People do what they can to stay sane. And if that means making entertainment despite being in the worst imaginable circumstances, that's what you do. Just to keep your mind off your misery. Just keep going in the hopes that at some point you'll be free again. So, yeah, that's, that's, that's totally understandable that they would do their best to get by and, and keep each other sane and going. Oh, sound like you said uh, something else. No, this chair really sucks. Oh, I'm so sorry. It's all right. I might have to pee Must not really. have been very happy. It's fine. Yet I have done it myself. I have cut papers and chains. A record of deaths. I know I keep pausing, but I just want to mention too, what I really like about Howard Zinn is that he builds a really strong case by using a lot of primary sources. So that was a, a an account from a former slave. Um, or perhaps maybe even, I don't know if this person was ever freed, but, but it was an account from a slave, nonetheless, of their life. So who better is going to be able to tell their story than people that, that actually live it? Um, and this makes his work very solid. It makes it hard to cut down as, as you know, you know, liberal garbage or leftist claptrap or whatever, you know, dismissive epithet people are going to hurl at it. So that's one thing that I do really appreciate about Zinn. A lot of primary sources, as many sources from the time as possible. A lot of direct quotes and first hand accounts. Sorry. Gonna call it a day. Chair hurts. Um, I really want to stay, but it hurts. Well, you know, you can always follow along on your phone or our tablet or other device and at least make comments in the chat if you so choose. Maybe I'll come back later. Okay. That'd be cool too. Anyway, now, uh, for now, thanks for your time. Thanks for lending your opinion and your your efforts to this really horrible uh, I'm, I'm a recounting. Woman. I have a voice too. You absolutely do. All right. Anyway, thanks for being on. Like you feel like and if you feel like coming back any any time tonight, don't hesitate. Like go. I did not say go. That, yeah. that those were you don't listen to words I'm saying. I'm saying the opposite of go. I'm saying I'm sorry to see you go. Don't kill your Birkin on the way out either. You think I'm trying? No. I'm saying so, careful. I will. <laughs> well. God. Anyway, thank you, Amanda, for, yeah, for joining. Oh, my God. Now you're going to not come back because you're all salty. Anyway, let's continue on. I'm sorry. kept in a plantation journal, now in the University of North Carolina archives, lists the ages and cause of death of all those who died on the plantation between 1850 and 1855. Of the 32 who died in that period, only four reached the age of 60. Four reached the age of 50, seven died in their 40s, seven died in their 20s or 30s, and nine died before they were five years old. But can statistics record what it meant for families to be torn apart. When a master for profit sold a husband or a wife, a son or a daughter, in 1858, a slave named Abraham Scriven was sold by his master and wrote to his wife, quote, 
Give my love to my father and mother and tell them goodbye for me. And if we shall not meet in this world, I hope to meet in heaven. Unquote. One recent book on slavery, Robert Fogel and Stanley Angerman, Time on the Cross, looks at whippings in 1840 through 1842 on the Barrow Plantation in Louisiana with 200 slaves. Quote, the records show that over the course of two years, a total of 160 whippings were administered, an average of 0.7 whippings per hand per year. About half of the hands were not whipped at all during the period." Unquote. One could also say half of all slaves were whipped. That has a different ring. That figure, 0.7 per hand per year, shows whipping was infrequent for any individual. But looked at another way, once every four or five days, some slave was whipped. Barrow, as a plantation owner, according to his biographer, was no worse than the average. He spent money on clothing for his slaves, gave them holiday celebrations, built a dance hall for them. He also built a jail and, quote, was constantly devising ingenious punishments, for he realized that uncertainty was an important aid in keeping his gangs well in hand, unquote. You know, there's 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 a glimmer of this that that still takes place today. Um, of course, I would say it would be a pretty uncontroversial thing to say that that the system of capitalism is a fairer and more just system of economic uh, configuration than slavery. Um, although, of course, it can be argued whether or not wage slavery counts as slavery as well. There's there's some good arguments for it, but you you know. You'll notice still that, oh, all these 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 really rich capitalists love philanthropy. They love to the conspicuous donations to charities, which um, oftentimes, especially when it's things like foundations, you can set whoever you want on the board. So it could be family members who are collecting, you know, five, six figure salaries to sit on a board where they have a couple maybe four meetings a year, once a quarter uh, meetings, and, and don't really do a whole lot. And there's the rules about the minimum amount of money you have to give away. Uh, or is that called an endowment? I don't remember exactly what it is. But there's a lot of evidence that not a lot of the dollars from any sort of philanthropy actually go to the cause that they, they say they do. And if you'll notice, uh, there's been how many hundreds of years of philanthropy now? conspicuous philanthropy, in fact, and there's still massive inequality. Um, it doesn't actually end up solving the problem, but they, they love doing it. And it's the same sort of thing that all these, these slave owners said, oh, look at me. I, I gave clothing to my slaves. I let them have celebrations. I, I you know, only whip them once in a while, these, these, these sorts of things. It's the same thing as like, oh, look at me. I'm so great. I have, I, I give away so much of my stuff. Well, most of my, you know, it's the Jeff Bezos sort of thing. I give away most of my wealth. Well, my workers barely scrape by in incredibly brutal working conditions. Um, but once in a while, they get a pizza party too. And, you know, we're real big about being team players and, you know, promoting from within. Uh, they'll give you this long litany of, of ways that they're not like the other guys when not only are they like the other guys, all those things they do are, are band-aid solutions to the fundamental fundamental inequality between owner class and worker class. So <laughs> don't let people be slave apologists with this sort of garbage and, and don't let people be capitalist apologists by citing the philanthropy of Bill Gates and the Gates Foundation or noting that... Uh, uh, Zuckerberg gave away, is you know planning to give away most of his money or all of his money, whatever it is, even though he ended up not actually doing that, but he got a big headline for it. Uh, it's all just smoke and mirrors. It's all just trying to rehabilitate the the image of people that basically legally steal from everyone every day, and that's how they get rich. The whippings, the punishments, were work disciplines. Still, Herbert Gutman, Slavery and the Numbers Game, finds, dissecting Fogel and Engerman's statistics, quote, 
Overall, four in five cotton pickers engaged in one or more disorderly acts in 1840 through 41. As a group, a slightly higher percentage of women than men committed seven or more disorderly acts." Unquote. Thus, Gutman disputes the argument of Fogel and Angerman that the Barrow Plantation slaves became, quote, "...devoted, hard-working, responsible slaves who identified their fortunes with the fortunes of their masters." Unquote. This is exactly the same sort of thing that wealthy business owners try to say today oh everyone loves my company they, they, they you know they're happy to come to work they whistle a song you know as they walk across the parking lot every morning still singing a tune as they leave in the evening um they they you know they they really are a team player they really see that the success of the company is success for them it's all bs it was all bs in this system it's all bs under capitalism like, unless you have some sort of commission system, at the very least, or stock in the company, you know, let alone, say, voting rights on major decisions, as, as major stockholders would, uh, you don't have any say in the company, and your fortunes are tied to consumer preference more than anything. You know, uh, I, I worked at one time for... The poorest performing Panera Bread in the entire metro uh, of Minneapolis, St. Paul. Uh, year, you know, quarter after quarter, whatever the, the, the length of time they divided up the year by. We had the lowest sales per what we should have had, or, or in relation to what we should have had. Um, lowest number of, of loyalty cards being given out, on and on and on. Uh, that same owner still works there. He still manages that store, that the franchise owner, the, the store manager. Um, they continue on. Uh, so, so nothing I ever did there made a lick of difference whether or not that, that store succeeded, let alone myself, whether I succeeded. I mean, aside from, you know, not working to get fired, it wouldn't have really mattered what I did. And it doesn't really matter what any employees do. They, they just continue on until perhaps someone makes a decision to close that. But I, I believe it's a franchise, so I don't think they even have the power to just close down franchises. But who knows? Who knows what's in the franchisee contract? Point being, <laughs> your fortunes are not tied to the place that you work unless you're the owner. Unless you directly benefit from that company doing well so owner maybe some stockholders that's about it so don't be fooled by this and certainly the fortunes of a slave <laughs> were not tied to how well their masters did i mean it's pretty easy to live off the backs of other people literally you know even if they don't do a good job right you still can undercut anyone who's having to pay their workers you you pretty much got it made as a business owner if other people do your work for you and not ever get anything in return other than the basic sustenance and shelter to continue to live so that's ridiculous Slave revolts in the United States were not as frequent or as large scale as those in the Caribbean islands or in South America. Probably the largest slave revolt in the United States took place near New Orleans in 1811. Four to five hundred slaves gathered after a rising at the plantation of a major Andry. Armed with cane knives, axes, and clubs, they wounded Andry, killed his son, and began marching from plantation to plantation, their numbers growing. They were attacked by U.S. Army and militia forces. Sixty-six were killed on the spot, and sixteen were tried and shot by a firing squad. Here we go. We see this pattern time and time again uh, in, in U.S. history, where when you threaten the, the foundations of an economic system, they will send the military after you. They're, they're not going to play around at that point. So they couldn't allow a, a slave revolt to continue on unabated, because that threatens the current order at its core. So yeah, it was brutally put down. People were shot at firing squad, 
just for the audacity of wanting to live as free people. Ah, but yeah. The conspiracy of Denmark Vesey, himself a free Negro, was thwarted before it could be carried out in 1822. The plan was to burn Charleston, South Carolina, then the sixth largest city in the nation, and to initiate a general revolt of slaves in the area. Several witnesses said thousands of blacks were implicated in one way or another. Blacks had made about 250 pike heads and bayonets, and over 300 daggers, according to Herbert Aptheker's account, but the plan was betrayed, and 35 blacks, including Vesey, were hanged. The trial record itself, published in Charleston, was ordered destroyed soon after publication, as too dangerous for slaves to see. Nat Turner's rebellion in <laughs> Southampton County, Virginia, in the summer of 1831, drew the slaveholding South into a panic, and then into a determined effort to bolster the security of the slave system. Turner, claiming religious visions, gathered about 70 slaves who went on a rampage from plantation to plantation, murdering at least 55 men, women, and children. They gathered supporters, but were captured as their ammunition ran out. Turner and perhaps 18 others were hanged. Did such rebellions set back the cause of emancipation as some moderate abolitionists claimed at the time? Again, we see those echoes through history. Oh, don't go out and protest. You're setting back your cause. Certainly don't block traffic. You're setting back your cause. Don't, don't, don't protest that way. That's too disruptive and people are just trying to enjoy a football game. You're setting back your cause. They will say this no matter what you do. The point is, if you can if you can have an endless debate on the appropriate venue and the appropriate messaging and the appropriate level of, of um, force used, if you can debate those things endlessly, you never have to actually talk about what the people are revolting or protesting or going up against, striking against, you know? It's, it's just a diversionary tactic to muddy the waters and have endless debate about side issues that got nothing to do with the issue at hand. Moderate abolitionists. Oh, my God. These, these would be... Um, yeah, these would be, just, you know, you're straight down the line center Democrats these days. Oh, 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 let's not make too many waves. Um, we understand that you all want to end police brutality, but... There's, there's a time and place, right, guys? Uh, oh, yeah, we, we understand. Uh, you're, you're tired of your wages stagnating and, and you want something better. But, yeah, don't just just don't get violent about it. Don't 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 certainly don't shut down industry in the name of, of doing what you want. Um, yep. So the, uh, you know, the moderates would be the Joe Biden's of their day calling for or just to say, you know, siding with. Uh, the owners against management like he did, or against uh, labor like he just did with the railroad worker strike. <clears throat> Moderate is only friend of the right. They only enable the right. It's funny how that always happens. They never preach moderation in the other direction. It's never, you know, hey, you guys, uh, let's, let's, let's tone it down just a little bit. Uh, you know, who are they saying that during the January 6th, right? Oh, it was okay what they did, but they just they just should have toned it down just a little bit. Uh, no. An answer was given in 1845 by James Hammond, a supporter of slavery. Quote, But if your course was wholly different, if you distilled nectar from your lips and discoursed sweetest music, do you imagine you could prevail on us to give up a thousand millions of dollars in the value of our slaves and a thousand millions of dollars more in the depreciation of our lands? The slave owner understood this and prepared. Henry Tragel, the Southampton Slave Revolt of 1831, says, quote, In 1831, Virginia was an armed and garrisoned state, with a total population of 1,211,405. The state of Virginia was able to field a militia force of 101,488 men, including cavalry, artillery, grenadiers, riflemen, and light infantry. 
It is true that this was a paper army in some ways, in that the county regiments were not fully armed and equipped, but it is still an astonishing commentary on the state of the public mind of the time. During a period when neither the state nor the nation faced any sort of exterior threat, we find that Virginia felt the need to maintain a security force, roughly 10% of the total number of its inhabitants, black and white, male and female, slave and free. Rebellion, though rare, was a constant fear among slave owners. Ulrich Phillips, a southerner whose American Negro slavery is a classic study, wrote, quote, a great number of Southerners at all times held the firm belief that the Negro population was so docile, so little cohesive, and in the main so friendly toward the whites, and so contented that a disastrous insurrection by them would be impossible. But on the other hand, there was a much greater anxiety abroad in the land than historians have told of. Eugene Genovese, in his comprehensive study of slavery, Roll, Jordan, Roll, sees a record of, quote, simultaneous accommodation and resistance to slavery, unquote. The resistance included stealing property, sabotage and slowness, killing overseers and masters, burning down plantation buildings, running away. Even the accommodation, quote, breathed a critical spirit and disguised subversive actions, unquote. Most of this resistance, Genovese stresses, fell short of organized insurrection, but its significance for masters and slaves was enormous. Running away was much more realistic than armed insurrection. During the 1850s, about a thousand slaves a year escaped into the North, Canada, and Mexico. Thousands ran away for short periods, and this despite the terror facing the runaway. The dogs used in tracking fugitives, quote, bit, tore, mutilated, and if not pulled off in time, killed their prey, Genovese says. Kind of sounds like police dogs of today. Oh, sorry, can't control my dog. I don't know why it won't unlock its its bite from you or why it keeps biting you, even though I tell it not to and stuff like that. Which, let's let's not blame the dogs in this situation. They were trained and, and brutalized until they behaved that way by human beings. So again, it comes back to the, the people that are using them as weapons. Harriet Tubman, born into slavery, her head injured by an overseer when she was 15, made her way to freedom alone as a young woman, then became the most famous conductor on the Underground Railroad. She made 19 dangerous trips back and forth, often disguised, escorting more than 300 slaves to freedom, always carrying a pistol, telling the fugitives, you'll be free or die. She expressed her philosophy, quote, there was one of the two things I had a right to, liberty or death. If I could not have one, I would have the other, for no man should take me alive. The much better quote of liberty, give me liberty or give me death, than that Patrick Henry, which I think that's pretty much all he did. One overseer told a visitor to his plantation that, quote, some Negroes are determined never to let a white man whip them and will resist you when you attempt it. Of course, you must kill them in that case." Unquote. One form of resistance was not to work so hard. W.E.B. Du Bois wrote in The Gift of Black Folk, quote, As a tropical product with a sensuous receptivity to the beauty of the world, he was not as easily reduced to be the mechanical draft horse which the northern European laborer became. He tended to work as the results pleased him, and refused to work or sought to refuse when he did not find the spiritual returns adequate. Thus, he was easily accused of laziness and driven as a slave when, in truth, he brought to modern manual labor a renewed valuation of life. Ulrich Phillips described truancy, absconding, and vacations without leave, and resolute efforts to escape from bondage altogether. He also described collective actions. Quote, Occasionally, however, a squad would strike in a body as a protest against severities. An episode of this sort was recounted in a letter of a Georgia overseer to his absent employer. Quote, Sir, I write you a few lines in order to let you know that six of your hands have left the plantation. Every man but Jack. They displeased me with their work, and I give some of them a few lashes. Tom with the rest. On Wednesday morning, they were missing. 
The instances where poor whites helped slaves were not frequent, but sufficient to show the need for setting one group against the other. Genovese says, quote, the slaveholders suspected that non-slaveholders would encourage slave disobedience and even rebellion, not so much out of sympathy for the blacks as out of hatred for the rich planters and resentment of their own poverty. White men sometimes were linked to slave insurrectionary plots, and each such incident rekindled fears." Unquote. Hey, there, there's a pretty uh, early version of class solidarity there. They, they saw <laughs> that not only were the slave people, of course, being treated uh, horrendously, but because they were doing their work for free, there was no actual labor under a capitalist system to really be done. It's a big reason that a lot of southern cities didn't develop until well into uh, the 19th century uh, as, as capitalism took more of a hold because there was just no need for it. You know, they were, they were just very agrarian um, primary producers. And when you have endless supplies of free labor, there's not a lot of reason or impetus to innovate or change or do much of anything. Kind of makes you wonder about capitalism now too when you see these large companies just basically resting on um, their size as a means to force out the rest of the competition, squash new ideas, uh, buy up all kinds of intellectual property that they never do anything with except for sue others if they ever get too close, um, buy up other companies to just to absorb them and not have to be competitors. You kind of wonder how many, how many brilliant ideas are being totally destroyed every year uh, in the name of maintaining your competitive edge or your market dominance or your market share, however you want to phrase it. Uh, I would wager that, that in a system that is truly free to... Um, where, where people are, are, are much more free, that is to say, where they don't have to worry about daily struggles of, of shelter, food, um, and all that sort of thing, where they're not forced to work for companies they don't really care about under threat of starvation. I, I wonder how much further we could get in terms of, you know, technological, um, philosophical, whatever sort of progress metric you want to look at it, if we were to just have everyone be free and actually allow good ideas to come to the fore because they benefit everyone, not just a select few. That, I mean, that in the end of the, at the end of the day, maybe that is the, 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 the secret to finally destroying the capitalist system is to just beat it at its own game, out innovate it by making everyone win instead. Um, that's certainly how capitalism did it to feudalism. Uh, there was just not, again, when you, when you got an endless supply of, of basically free labor in, in your serfs, what reason do you have to really innovate much? Maybe, maybe in terms of military warfare, just so you can maintain that. But otherwise, you know, what does it matter? You're, you're just as rich and, and, uh, fattened off the labor of, of others and, and happy and can do anything in your wildest dreams, whether or not, you know, you allow people to innovate or not, or you just keep things exactly as they are. Capitalism came along and said, hey, we can innovate even better if we allow people to choose who they work for, uh, allow them to have a, a worker-owner relationship rather than a lord and serf relationship. And eventually they just ended up out competing feudalism. So, I mean, that's the, that's really the long and short of it. It wasn't just some, some notion of altruism. Uh, I mean, that certainly helped the ideas breaking down of the divine right of Kings of, of infallibility of, of Lords and rulers of one kind or another, um, as being ordained by God, that certainly would have helped. But at the end of the day, it was innovation because of greater human freedom. So I think we could perhaps pursue that as an avenue to, again, beat the current system. Just a thought.
This helps explain the stern police measures against whites who fraternized with blacks. Herbert Aftheker quotes a report to the governor of Virginia on a slave conspiracy in 1802, quote, I have just received information that three white persons are concerned in the plot, and they have arms and ammunition concealed under their houses, and were to give aid when the Negroes should begin, unquote. One of the conspiring slaves said that it was, quote, the common run of poor white people, unquote, who were involved. In return, blacks helped whites in need. One black runaway told of a slave woman who had received 50 lashes of the whip for giving food to a white neighbor who was poor and sick. When the Brunswick Canal was built in Georgia, the black slaves and white Irish workers were segregated, the excuse being that they would do violence against one another. That may well have been true, but Fanny Kemble, the famous actress and wife of a planter, wrote in her journal, quote, but the Irish are not only quarrelers and rioters and fighters and drinkers and despisers of N-words. They are a passionate, impulsive, warm-hearted, generous people, much given to powerful indignations, which break out suddenly when not compelled to smolder sullenly. Pestilent sympathizers, too, and with a sufficient dose of American atmospheric air in their lungs, properly mixed with a right proportion of ardent spirits, there is no saying but what they might actually take to sympathy with the slaves and I'll leave you to judge of the possible consequences. Yeah, well, let's think back to uh, previous chapters when they were they were talking about westward expansion, when basically it was just New England, that and that was uh, the American colonies. And they were afraid more than anything of black slaves, uh, poor whites, and Native Americans all banding together with their common interest, their common intersectional interest against the white ruling class. This is this has always been their fear, and I mean they're right to fear that because that is really the only other true power there is to counterbalance uh, whoever the entrenched ruling class is at the time. And that's the fact that they're always way, way, way outnumbered. Uh, not to mention that the the bulk of their militaries are made up by working class people. Um, Working class, often not very well-to-do people. So, yeah, interesting that we, we always see that as a grave fear that, that people get together and just decide not to have that system. Kind of maybe makes you think that uh, that system is not so great to begin with if so many people have a really good reason to oppose it, that you have to be afraid of them even commingling with one another. You perceive, I am sure, that they can by no means be allowed to work together on the Brunswick Canal. The need for slave control led to an ingenious device, paying poor whites, themselves so troublesome for 200 years of Southern history, to be overseers of black labor and therefore buffers for black hatred. Religion was used for control. A book consulted by many planters was the Cotton Plantation Record and Account Book which gave these instructions to overseers. Quote, You will find that an hour devoted every Sabbath morning to their moral and religious instruction would prove a great aid to you in bringing about a better state of things amongst the Negroes. Unquote. As for black preachers, as Genovese puts it, quote, They had to speak a language defiant enough to hold the high-spirited among their flock, but neither so inflammatory as to raise them to battles they could not win, nor so ominous as to arouse the ire of ruling powers, unquote. Practicality decided, quote, The slave communities, embedded as they were among numerically preponderant and militarily powerful whites, counseled a strategy of patience of acceptance of what could not be helped, and of a dogged effort to keep the black community alive and healthy, a strategy of survival that, like its African prototype, above all said yes to life in this world." Unquote. It was once thought that slavery had destroyed the black family, and so the black condition was blamed on family frailty rather than on poverty and prejudice. Blacks without families, helpless, lacking kinship and identity, would have no will to resist. But interviews with ex-slaves done in the 1930s by the Federal Writers Project of the New Deal for the Library of Congress showed a different story, which George Raywick summarizes from sundown to sunup. 
The slave community acted like a generalized extended kinship system in which all adults looked after all children and there was a little division between my children for whom I'm responsible and your children for whom you're responsible. A kind of family relationship in which older children have great responsibility for caring for younger siblings is obviously more functionally integrative and useful for slaves than the pattern of sibling rivalry and often dislike that frequently comes out of contemporary middle class nuclear families composed of highly individuated persons. Indeed, the activity of the slaves in creating patterns of family life that were functionally integrative did more than merely prevent the destruction of personality. It was part and parcel, as we shall see, of the social process out of which came black pride, black identity, black culture, the black community, and black rebellion in America. Old letters and records dug out by historian Herbert Gutman, The Black Family in Slavery and Freedom, show the stubborn resistance of the slave family to pressures of disintegration. A woman wrote to her son, from whom she had been separated for 20 years, quote, I long to see you in my old age. Now, my dear son, I pray you to come and see your dear old mother. I love you, Cato. You love your mother. You are my only son, unquote. A man wrote to his wife, sold away from him with their children, quote, Send me some of the children's hair in a separate paper with their names on the paper. I had rather anything to have happened to me most than ever to have been parted from you and the children. Laura, I do love you the same." Unquote. Going through records of slave marriages, Gutman found how high was the incidence of marriage among slave men and women and how stable these marriages were. He studied the remarkably complete records kept on one South Carolina plantation. He found a birth register of 200 slaves extending from the 18th century to just before the Civil War. It showed stable kin networks, steadfast marriages, unusual fidelity, and resistance to forced marriages. Slaves hung on determinedly to their selves, to their love of family, their wholeness. A shoemaker on the South Carolina Sea Islands expressed this in his own way, quote, I've lost an arm, but it hasn't gone out of my brains, unquote. This family solidarity carried into the 20th century. The remarkable Southern black farmer Nate Shaw recalled that when his sister died, leaving three children, his father proposed sharing their care. And he responded, quote, that suits me, Papa. Let's handle him like this. Don't get the two little boys, the youngest ones, off at your house, and the oldest one be at my house, and we hold these little boys apart and won't bring them to see one another. I'll bring the little boy that I keep, the oldest one, around to your home amongst the other two. And you forward the others to my house and let them grow up knowing that they are brothers. Don't keep them separated in a way that they'll forget about one another. Don't do that, Papa. Also insisting on the strength of blacks even under slavery, Lawrence Levine, Black Culture and Black Consciousness, gives a picture of a rich culture among slaves, a complex mixture of adaptation and rebellion through the creativity of stories and songs. We raise the wheat, they give us the corn. We bake the bread, they give us the crust. We sift the meal, they give us the husk. We peel the meat, they give us the skin. And that's the way they take us in. We skim the pot, they give us the liquor. And say that's good enough for N-word. There was mockery. The poet William Cullen Bryant, after attending a corn shucking in 1843 in South Carolina, told of slave dances turned into a pretended military parade, quote, a sort of burlesque of our militia trainings, unquote. Spirituals often had double meanings. The song, O Canaan, Sweet Canaan, I Am Bound for the Land of Canaan, often meant that slaves meant to get to the north, their Canaan. During the Civil War, slaves began to make up new spirituals with bolder messages. Before I'd be a slave, I'd be buried in my grave and go home to my Lord and be saved. And the spiritual, many thousand go. No more peck of corn for me, no more, no more. No more driver's lash for me, no more, no more. Levine refers to slave resistance as pre-political. Expressed in countless ways in daily life and culture, music, magic, art, religion were all ways, he says, for slaves to hold on to their humanity. While Southern slaves held on, free blacks in the North, there were about 130,000 in 1830, about 200,000 in 1850, agitated for the abolition of slavery. In 1829, David Walker, son of a slave but born free in North Carolina, moved to Boston where he sold old clothes. 
The pamphlet he wrote and printed, Walker's Appeal, became widely known. It infuriated Southern slaveholders. Georgia offered a reward of $10,000 to anyone who would deliver Walker alive and $1,000 to anyone who would kill him. It is not hard to understand why when you read his appeal. There was no slavery in history, even that of the Israelites in Egypt, worse than the slavery of the black man in America, Walker said. Quote, Show me a page of history, either sacred or profane, on which a verse can be found which maintains that the Egyptians heaped the insupportable insult upon the children of Israel by telling them that they were not of a human family, unquote. Walker was scathing to his fellow blacks who would assimilate, quote, I would wish candidly to be understood that I would not give a pinch of snuff to be married to any white person I ever saw in all the days of my life, unquote. Blacks must fight for their freedom. He said, quote, let our enemies go on with their butcheries and at once fill up their cup. Never make an attempt to gain our freedom or natural right from under our cruel oppressors and murderers until you see your way clear. When that hour arrives and you move, be not afraid or dismayed. God has been pleased to give us two eyes, two hands, two feet, and some sense in our heads as well as they. They have no more right to hold us in slavery than we have to hold them. Our sufferings will come to an end, in spite of all the Americans, this side of eternity. Then we will want all the learning and talents among ourselves, and perhaps more, to govern ourselves. Every dog must have its day. The Americans is coming to an end. Once again, all, all these these... People who are just assumed to be backwards and uncultured and uncult unculturable and unlearned and just, uh, you know, every every derogatory thing that you can think of uh, by the the dominant peoples of the time still produce uh, stuff like that, like what like what was just read out with eloquence, nuance. Uh, it's amazing what happens when you are actually allowed to have a voice. Um, I don't know. I, I, I'm getting, yeah, too many thoughts at once. So we'll just continue. One summer day in 1830, David Walker was found dead mm -hmm. near the doorway of his shop in Boston. Some born in slavery acted out the unfulfilled desire of millions. Frederick Douglass, a slave sent to Baltimore to work as a servant and a laborer in the shipyard, somehow learned to read and write, and at 21, in the year 1838, escaped to the North, where he became the most famous black man of his time. As lecturer, newspaper editor, writer, in his autobiography, Narrative of the Life of Frederick Douglass, he recalled his first childhood thoughts about his condition. Quote, why am I a slave? Why are some people slaves and others masters? Was there ever a time when this was not so? How did the relation commence? Once, however, engaged in the inquiry, I was not very long in finding out the true solution of the matter. It was not color, but crime, not God, but man that afforded the true explanation of the existence of slavery. Nor was I long in finding out another important truth, viz. what man can make, man can unmake. Mm -hmm. I distinctly remember being... E Very important. Just to, to reiterate, there is no system that, that people have ever made that can't be changed, that can't be undone, that is eternal. That is an impossibility. There's no end to history. No matter how hard the, the entrenched powers that be may want it so, there's always a way to change things. Um, yeah, I, got, I mean, I'm not adding anything really, so we'll just uh, continue on. Even then, more strongly impressed with the idea of being a free man someday, this cheering assurance was an inborn dream of my human nature a constant menace to slavery, and one which all the powers of slavery were unable to silence or extinguish. The Fugitive Slave Act passed in 1850 was a concession to the southern states in return for the admission of the Mexican War territories, California especially. Here we go. The, the, the moderates compromise. Some more slavery? Hmm, hmm, guys, can we get along now? 
between abolition and 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 continuation. Jeez. Once again, concessions, moderation, benefiting the reactionaries into the Union as non-slave states. The act made it easy for slave owners to recapture ex-slaves or simply to pick up blacks they claimed had run away. Northern blacks organized resistance to the Fugitive Slave Act, denouncing President Fillmore, who signed it, and Senator Daniel Webster, who supported it. One of these was J.W. Logan, son of a slave mother and her white owner. He had escaped to freedom on his master's horse, gone to college, and was now a minister in Syracuse, New York. He spoke to a meeting in that city in 1850. The time has come to change the tones of submission into tones of defiance, and to tell Mr. Fillmore and Mr. Webster, if they propose to execute this measure upon us, to send on their bloodhounds, I received my freedom from heaven. And with it came the command to defend my title to it. I don't respect this law. I don't fear it. I won't obey it. It outlaws me, and I outlaw it. I will not live a slave, and if force is employed to re-enslave me, I shall make preparations to meet the crisis as becomes a man. Absolutely. There is no moral high ground in following unjust laws, in obeying unjust edicts, in accepting unjust systems. So, that... Yeah, says it all there. Your decision tonight in favor of resistance will give vent to the spirit of liberty and it will break the bands of party and shout for joy all over the North. Heaven knows that this act of noble daring will break out somewhere and may God grant that Syracuse be the honored spot whence it shall send an earthquake voice through the land. The following year, Syracuse had its chance. A runaway slave named Jerry was captured and put on trial. A crowd used crowbars and a battering ram to break into the courthouse, defying marshals with drawn guns, and set Jerry free. Logan made his home in Syracuse, a major station on the Underground Railroad. It was said that he helped 1,500 slaves on their way to Canada. His memoir of slavery came to the attention of his former mistress, and she wrote to him, asking him either to return or to send her $1,000 in compensation. Logwin's reply to her was printed in the abolitionist newspaper, The Liberator. Quote, Miss Sarah Logue, you say you have offers to buy me and that you shall sell me if I do not send you $1,000, and in the same breath, almost in the same sentence, you say, you know, we raised you as we did our own children. Woman, did you raise your own children for the market? Did you raise them for the whipping post? Did you raise them to be driven off, bound to a coffle in chains? Shame on you. But you say I am a thief because I took the old mare along with me. Have you got to learn that I had a better right to the old mare, as you call her, than Manasseh Logue had to me? Is it a greater sin for me to steal his horse than it was for him to rob my mother's cradle and steal me? Have you got to learn that human rights are mutual and reciprocal, and if you take my liberty and life, you forfeit your own liberty and life? Before God and high heaven, is there a law for one man which is not a law for every other man? If you or any other speculator on my body and rights wish to know how I regard my rights, they need but come here and lay their hands on me to enslave me. Yours, etc., J.W. Logan. Frederick Douglass knew that the shame of slavery was not just the South's, that the whole nation was complicit in it. On the 4th of July, 1852, he gave an Independence Day address. Quote, Fellow citizens, pardon me, and allow me to ask, why am I called upon to speak here today? What have I or those I represent to do with your national independence? Are the great principles of political freedom and of national justice embodied in that Declaration of Independence extended to us? And am I therefore called upon to bring our humble offering to the national altar and to confess the benefits and express devout gratitude for the blessings resulting from your independence to us? What to the American slave is your 4th of July? I answer, a day that reveals to him more than all other days of the year the gross injustice and cruelty to which he is the constant victim, to him, 
Your celebration is a sham. Your boasted liberty and unholy license. Your national greatness, swelling vanity. Your sounds of rejoicing are empty and heartless. Your denunciation of tyrants, brass-fronted impudence. Your shouts of liberty and equality, hollow mockery. Your prayers and hymns, your sermons and thanksgivings, with all your religious parade and solemnity, are to him mere bombast, fraud, deception, impiety, and hypocrisy, a thin veil to cover up crimes which would disgrace a nation of savages. There is not a nation of the earth guilty of practices more shocking and bloody than are the people of these United States at this very hour. Go where you may, search where you will, roam through all the monarchies and despotisms of the old world, travel through South America, search out every abuse, and when you have found the last, lay your facts by the side of the everyday practices of this nation, and you will say with me that, for revolting barbarity and shameless hypocrisy, America reigns without rival. Damn. <laughs> Uh, yeah, right, um, yeah, uh, like, there's no real point in, in doing the oppression Olympics or trying to compare one to another, but, it, yeah, it, I mean, we, we you know. I'm, I'm even struggling to find the words, but yes, that is that is true. America is exceptionally bloody and violent in its history of conquering this continent. Um, and then, you know, instituting the most brutal, repressive form of slavery ever seen on Earth. I mean, it's just, it, uh, I can only go back to that the, this is why this stuff is so important. So we don't just buy into the, the you know, blind patriotism of, oh, this is the greatest country ever created, and it has God on its side, or, you know, whatever patriots will say about, oh, well, it's wonderful achievements. You can't just look at one side of the picture. You have to face the entire thing to see where it's gone wrong and how it's gone wrong and what the repercussions of those wrong things uh, have been and continue to be. Uh, that might be a good place to end it for tonight, actually. We're coming up to uh, the nine o'clock hour, my time. Yeah, I mean, I, I, you can see why not everyone believes in, in the, the symbols of, of patriotism that, that others do in America. Why for so many, especially around the world, the symbol of the U.S. flag is not one of freedom and liberty and, and prosperity and stuff, but one of, well, hey, bombshells are coming or um, our land is going to be plundered or... We're going to be given a really raw deal on labor practices. Oh, but we should be grateful to have any labor at all, any jobs at all, because otherwise we'd just be subsistence farmers. You can see why for so many people, um, why, you know, kneeling before the flag was, was such a powerful act. And why so many people who do not feel, again, that they are enfranchised the way that that um, that flag is supposedly supposed to uh, represent, um, and why they would not feel reverence for it. Why they would feel that this this country has a long way to go before it can claim the mantle of just and free. Um, Yeah, wow. Yeah, yeah. As I said from the beginning, this is going to be one of the hardest chapters to go through. 
and it's it's proving as much. It's just one story after another one. One more act of brutality and cruelty and utter disregard for others' humanity. Um, and at the same time, just seeing just the, the, the tremendous, defying all odds, humanity and uh, just an invaluable point of view from the people that, that, that live through it on the other side. The slaves, the former slaves, the... Um, yeah, interesting, we haven't really heard anything from abolitionists in this chapter that I can think of. But in a way, that's good. And, you know, what exactly would they add to this story that the slaves themselves could not tell? Hard to say. But yeah, well, we'll leave it there tonight. And I think that's, that's probably about all I can take for one session. We made a good dent in the chapter, 41 minutes in of two hours so it's going to be at least a three-parter it looks like perhaps four um but that's okay that's okay doing this stuff together right uh let's see only a couple people still hanging with me but that's all right that's still enough to give somebody a raid let's see who's on right now Oh, any thoughts as we close either? I'd love to hear them. Whew. Yeah, I think whoever I write into is going to have to be doing something. Maybe Epic Prawn will be a good one. Mellow Monday just chatting. Let's see what they are up to. Ah. Oh. Doing some video games, watching some Cody Shody. Who is Andrew Yang? Okay, that's not a super difficult video of theirs. I don't want to just put you from the frying pan into the fire. Um, yeah, let's let's rate Epic Prawn tonight. Thank you all for joining. Thank you, Amanda, for coming on. We will pick this back up uh, next Monday. It's uh, 7 p.m. Central Standard Time. And this, this upcoming Sunday will be my next stream. Be back with Dan Platt, looking at videos, probably more stuff on planning, socialism, organizing, all kinds of cool, groovy stuff. So look forward to that. And have a good night, everybody. We're going to start the stream presently, so hang on. There we go. Starting the raid. Thank you all for joining.